on 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 6. So we can stand for the word. And it says uh, in the New King James, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness. Tonight, I will be teaching on self-control. <sighs> Father, we thank you for everything that you have done. And mighty God, we thank you for what you are about to do. Jesus, we cannot have enough thanks on our lips, enough praise in our heart for you. But we stand before you, Father, as what you have purchased. And we are here to glorify your name and bask in your glory. In your most holy name, Jesus Christ, we pray all things. Amen. You may be seated. So as I was going through this, uh, self-control. The Lord began to deal with me as He normally does. And I, I feel <clears throat> impressed to ask that tonight sometimes I find myself when I am listening to a message that my mind will wander to, man, I wish they really heard that. I wish they were here. I wish my mom, my dad, whoever it may apply to. But this message is about self-control. So please receive the message while looking into the mirror of yourself. Don't let your mind wander to someone else. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, it states, And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Temperate, self-control. It's talking about Discipline. Be disciplined. The greatest athletes in this world will spend their whole life revolving around a game. They will do everything. They will, they will leave their family. They will not have friends. From their waking moment till the time they go to sleep, their whole life revolves around a perishable crown. Football season just started. And it doesn't matter if they go undefeated. It doesn't matter if a team accomplishes it, wins it all, because next year, they're going to start the whole process over. But they require discipline to achieve their goal. Our walk with Christ is no different. We need discipline. And feel free, um, since Sister Wanda is not here, to give me a, you know, give me a shout. And if I say something incorrect, feel free to glare. It's okay. <laughs> It'll make me miss her less. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she glares. She, she's very, very adamant about the truth. And if something doesn't line up, you'll know. Church, we live in a sinful world. That cannot be changed. 
Not right now. There will come a day where God will reign and it will no longer be sinful. It will be made new. It will be perfect. But where we are at, it is sinful. We can't avoid sinful influence. It's everywhere. So in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10, Paul writes, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or ex extortioners or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. Paul is asking you to be wary of who you keep your company with. Be wary of who has influence over your life. Be self-controlled in who is going to be in your inner circle. But he's also saying, don't shun these people. Because we can't leave this world. We can't just go off into the woods and be a church. Because God wants the covetous. He wants the idolater and the extortioner. He needs us to do it. We can't just be isolationists and say, well, you're sinners, we're saved. But we must guard our heart from their way of thinking. Because their way of thinking will destroy your walk. When possible, avoid temptation. It says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Evil company will corrupt. Not good all of a sudden changes evil. But evil will corrupt your good habits. Do not go out of your way to be exposed to sin. Don't do it. You will find that you are not as spiritually strong as you think you are. That's not an insult. That's not an attack. That's the truth. All of us are capable of stumbling. So limit your exposure to the stumbling blocks. Guard your home. Guard your heart. Guard your eyes. Guard your ears. And this has to be done actively. This cannot just happen. It's not, oh, well, I'm just going to do it today. No. No, no, no. This takes self-control. You have to consciously work at this. If you don't, you will find things starting to trickle into your life. Little by little, bit by bit, Satan will find the cracks in your walls and he'll begin to seep through. It says, test all things, hold fast to what is good, and abstain from every form of evil. Church, as I was going through this, I asked God, I was like, Lord, I need some, some examples of self-control. I need examples of what not to do. Now, I can look at my own life and pretty much say, that's what you shouldn't do. But when it said abstain from every form of evil, God, he showed me King Solomon. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, King Solomon says, Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor... And this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done and all the labor which I had toiled. And indeed there was vanity and grasping for the wind. 
there was no prophet under the sun. King Solomon had a kingdom so rich that we can't even fathom that today. It has never occurred again. We have had some wealthy kingdoms pop up. But he had the whole known world paying tribute to him. And King Solomon partook in everything of the world. Everything. He says, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. He saw, he wanted, and he got. He partook. So what happened to King Solomon? King Solomon sitting there in 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughters of the Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, from the nations whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart, for it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God and was the heart of his father David. Church, this world will do everything it can to catch your eye. Everything it can. Now Solomon had everything. Everything. And he ends his life saying it was all in vanity. It was all pointless. He spent a life securing every worldly pleasure he could ever think of. He built himself a palace. He built the greatest temple this world has probably ever seen. And it was all for nothing. It was all for nothing. The wisest king wasted his life chasing after the world because he saw he lacked self-control. He lacked discipline. Your walk with the Lord takes discipline because everywhere you walk, there will be a demon saying, well, this, this will be so much better. Over here, this is so much more fun. You'll like it if you just come and do. And Solomon had 700 wives. 700 wives. I don't even know how he kept their names straight. That's crazy. That, that's crazy. If that was by today's standard, he would be, I mean, he'd be on every talk show. <laughs> it's crazy. 700 wives. But what's interesting and what we must take note is that at the end of his life, he recognizes his folly. He recognizes that he really messed up. That a man with all the wisdom wasted it on himself. And he had all the wisdom. He really did. And he built a great kingdom. Not one sword came against him the whole time. Why? Because God promised it. He promised that the sword wouldn't come. His father David fought for the kingdom and gave it to him. He didn't have to do anything. He had it all. And God blessed him and continued to bless him. But all Solomon could do was look at the world and say, I want some more of that. He could see the most beautiful woman and say, oh, well, I want her as my wife. And then see the next, well, give me that one too. And that one, and that one. 
he had more gold and silver that they just stopped counting it. They just stopped counting. They're like, just bring it in. That's his kingdom. But the Lord, the Lord became angry with Solomon. Because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. And church, you don't need a statue. You don't need a Quran to have a false god. Anything that you put in front of the Lord, that is a false god. For many Americans, I will tell you right now, the TV is their God. And it is spewing forth its doctrine 24 hours a day, peddling nothing but lies and fear. That's all the TV does. It lies to you. I have watched the news after coming home from war and know that they're lying. These shows, they're not real. They're actors. None of it is real. It's a fantasy. You turn it on to be lied to. And you spend your whole life doing it. But it can be anything. Shopping can be your God. Snow machining, snowboarding, any of it. Take your pick. Because your life, when you reflect on it, what do you spend your time doing? There are all things, church, that we have to do. There are things that we are obligated to do. But when it comes time with our free time, how do you choose to spend it? Where do you spend your time? Is it with the Lord? Does the Lord have the biggest portion of your time? Or is he just getting the crumb off the pie? Is he just getting a prayer right before you go to bed? He's just getting five verses in the book. I'll read real quick. That way I don't feel guilty. That's not what God's calling from us. That's not what he desires. He desires to be number one in the life. He desires to be number one in the heart. He desires to be Lord above all things. That includes your loved ones, your wife, your husband, your children. He desires all things. But if you will just put them there, you won't begin to even be able to count the blessings. He will pour out. And the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Church, God has given you everything. You, me, no one is worthy of what goes on here. You cannot earn this. You do not deserve this. If you want to know what you deserve, go to Revelations and read about hell. Because that's what we all deserve. All of us. That's what we should get. The only reason it's not so is because our God is great. He is merciful and He is loving. That's it. It has nothing to do with you. You cannot earn to be in His presence. He has given it. But church, everything He gives, He asks, He demands, He commands, keep my statutes. Maintain the covenant between you and me. Because if you don't, you will find this being taken away from you. 
If we don't as a church, there are plenty of dead churches around here. Do not think for one second, God will not add another one. He will kill this church to protect his name. We are blessed. We are not entitled. The Lord God asks, you keep what I have commanded you, and I will bless, and I will continue to bless. And God blesses everywhere in the Bible. Everywhere in the Bible, God blesses. Such blessings that people are astounded by the blessings. Such blessings that if you read the Bible, it's amazing because sometimes it's hard to wrap your mind around it. How many blessings God will pour out. Church, I could stand here all night. I promise you, I could stand here all night and try and recount everything God has done in each person's life. We could go around with a testimonial and we will be into the twilight hours. And we won't even begin to touch it. In one year, His blessings are everywhere. But He expects you to be disciplined in your walk. We are not, we are not a church We are not a people that are purchased by Him so that we can freely sin. This Christian American false doctrine that has come says, oh, well, you can have your God and the world too. No. No. That's a lie. The world... And God, they're not mixing. So where does the battle lie? It starts not out there. It starts right in here and right in here. You are in control of your thoughts. It may not feel like it at times. But you are in control of your thoughts. Colossians 3, 2. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Get your mind off of worldly things. Get it off of the world. You want to know what the world does? Go watch the news. Truly. Don't worry about the stories. Don't worry about what they're talking about. Experience the fear that they have. The panic that is dwelling in them. Because they don't know what's going to happen. Everything's on the brink of chaos. Everything they have built their life on is about ready to crumble. And they don't know what to do. And they want everybody panicking. And church, it's going to collapse. It's going to collapse. It says in Revelations, it's going to collapse. It needs to collapse. So that the new world order can come in. So that the Antichrist can come. But we're not to fear that. Because Jesus will come. And he will take us. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You want your thoughts under control? Keep your mind on the Lord. Keep your mind on Jesus. Everything. God says everything starts with the heart. Everything starts with a thought. 
Every murder that's ever happened started up here first. Everything comes from within. If you can't control that, you will have no control in your life. You will have no control in your walk. You will feel like you are constantly in chaos, being thrown around by the wind, going left and right, because you are not rooted in Jesus. One day's great, one day's not. Church, when you think, when you think about God, and you realize in your heart that He is coming. Does it matter if you had a bad day? This is temporary. This is going away. It's only for a minute. And then we get him forever. But church, discipline. Discipline of the mind. Because each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Church, an idea, an idea can change a person's life. God talks about the Word of God as a seed that if you will plant it in your heart, truly plant it, tend to it, protect it, it will grow so strong in you that it will support all life. It will become the greatest thing you could ever put in your heart. The mustard seed, which is the least of seeds, the smallest. The world says, this doesn't matter. It's the least. But if you'll put it in your heart, it grows to be the greatest. But sin, right here, sin is also a seed. That if you, if you will entertain the thought, it is going to begin to grow. It is going to begin to consume you. And it is not going to be satisfied with just the thoughts. It is going to want to become grown and it is going to want to sin. And you are going to sin. Why? Because you never put it in check while it was a thought. You never said no to it while it was just an idea. You let your brain play with it over and over and over again until it became strong. Until it started to create desires. This happened to King David. He saw Bathsheba. Now, Bathsheba was probably beautiful. Easy on the eyes, I'm sure. But the second he saw it, the second he saw it, the right thing should have been to look away. But he didn't. He entertained the thought. It took hold. And in him, this is a man after God's own heart. This is a man that has been through troubles. This is a man that stood up against Goliath saying, the Lord has got me. But Satan knows what you're going to trip over. And it only took a look. And because he didn't have discipline, he didn't present any self-control, he stared way too long. And that stare became a thought. That thought 
became a desire. That desire became an urge. That urge became a sin. And the man after God's own heart was now not right with the Lord. So he's not right to such a degree that you don't hear about David repenting. David doesn't repent. No, no. Because Bathsheba said, hey, what about God? Well, what about the desires of your king? David believed it was his right. He, in his sin, put himself above the Lord. Knowing God, knowing He's real, He has delivered you out of the hand of your enemy countless times. But the second the sin has been conceived, it's taking over. So then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food, drank from his own cup, and lay in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock, from his own herd, to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had to come. So David's anger was greatly aroused against this man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, I anointed you king over Israel. Church, that's the beauty of sin. When sin's in your life, and you hear about your own sin being portrayed in someone else, you can't tolerate it. It makes you sick. You want to judge that person. David was quick. Oh, he's going to die. Restore fourfold. Until you find out it's you. Because Romans 12, 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Sinning will make you a hypocrite. It's going to make you a hypocrite. We need to learn to hate evil. Hate sin. God says, abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Amen. Church, if you don't hate the sin, you will entertain it. If you don't hate it when it comes across your path, you're going to entertain. That's just a fact. Now, do not hate the sinner. The poor people who are outside these walls in their sin, they are slaves to it. Do not hate them for being enslaved. Have compassion and pity on that poor person. They don't even know, some of them, that they're slaves to their sin. They don't even understand how bitter they are. How resentful, how judgmental, how much they hate their life. They don't understand that there could be something different. You do. But they will never understand that if you're just going to point a finger of judgment at them. They will never be free. 
Church, God says, he said to David, I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have also given you much more. Who has ever come into this church needing a touch from God and leaving empty? Who has ever come seeking God and discovered He won't be found? He may have given you something on Sunday. You need more, He'll give you more. All you have to do is maintain discipline. Maintain self-control. Have God, His covenant between you and Him. Let that be more important than the sin that is trying to take you away from the Lord. Because church, when you sin, it is going to destroy you. But when you sin... It's not going to stop just there. It is going to end up destroying your house. When you sin, it is going to affect your spouse. When you sin, it is going to affect your children. It is going to harm them. And in David's case, and in some people's cases today, it will end up killing your kids. It will end up killing the ones you love. Your sin, sin does nothing but destroy everything it touches. God asked the question over and over to Israel. He asked the question, David, why have you despised the commandments of the Lord and do evil in his sight? Church, there is a God. And we, we know this. We who are sitting here know He's real. We who are sitting here have experienced His mighty power. We have witnessed His miracles. So what does it say about us when we put Him on the back seat? What does it say about us when we choose sin over Him? When we're harmed and we'd rather be wrathful than merciful. When we'd rather be judgmental rather than forgive. We rather participate and entertain the lusts of our flesh rather than our spirit. God sent Jonah to judge Nineveh. But you will constantly, constantly see Israel in judgment. You will constantly see Judah in judgment because they should know better They know there's a God, and they choose sin. I promise you, church, your sin breaks God's heart more than someone who doesn't know Him. Because you should know better. All of us should know better. We should know how great He is. We should be exuding the discipline over our life, some self-control and choosing Him rather than the world. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are the ones, you are that one slaves whom you obey whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. You are either going to be a slave to sin 
or to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves to righteousness. Therefore put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passions, evil desires, covetousness, which is all idolatry. Your sin that you will not get rid of in your life. And it doesn't have to be an outward sin. It doesn't have to be a direct sin. It just has to be a false god. If you hold on to it, you are not you are not in the good walk and you are in danger of being plucked away all of us are in danger of that if we will not exude self control if you will not control your thoughts and your actions satan can and he will snatch you And he won't do it with force. He will do it with a come hither. And you will willingly leave. Nobody will drag you out the door. You will go yourself. Church, God is dishonored when we exude a lack of self-control. 2 Samuel 12, 14. Romans 2, 23 through 24. 2 Peter 2 through 2. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. The world hates the world hates Christians. And they hate Christians for one reason. Because we're hypocrites. Hypocrites. That's why Muslims are the fastest growing religion. It may be a lie, but they believe it enough to live it. Christians don't. My father, his greatest joke the greatest line that he loves to say over and over and over, but I'm a Christian. He's not. He makes fun of Christians because he grew up with people drinking at the bar with them, saying, oh, but I'm a Christian. Out there chasing women with them, but I'm a Christian. Out there cussing, out there sinning, but I'm a Christian. He hates Christ and has never met him. All because a person's lack of self-control proves to a sinner God's not real. God's not real. You, in your sin, tell a non-believer, this is a lie. This is a lie. I don't really believe it. I don't really believe it. But church, God needs, He needs a group of people who are willing to present the love of Christ. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind and to do the things which are not fitting who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only to do the same, but to approve of those who practice them. If you want sin, God will turn you over to it. He will not keep you against your will. And you will find that when you want the world, you will start to approve of the world. You will start to approve of their actions. You will start wanting to hang out with them, and you won't want to be here. 
because your self-control is not present. Your self-control is not present. And you are going to be eaten by the world. You cannot, you cannot walk away from this faith and think that you're going to have a worldly walk with Jesus. It doesn't happen. Church, there's one person that I kept looking at, I kept coming across. In John 6, 54, Jesus says his, his great, great saying, of whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. John 6, 60 through 64. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, <clears throat> who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. John 6, 66. Notice John 6, 6, 6. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. 666 walked with them no more. There's no such thing as coincidences in this book. He had a following, a massive following, that when they didn't understand, they left. They walked out on them. Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? Now, church, it should be made note that Judas didn't leave. How come? There was something in Judas that made him stay. I believe he truly loved God. That or he was astounded by the miracles that he saw. He was fascinated and had to keep coming. But his heart, his heart, even in the presence of Jesus, was not right. John 12, 4 through 6. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said... Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. Walking with God and all you care about is the world. Your eye is on the world sitting in the presence of the Lord. If Anybody finds themselves in that situation? Anybody. You sit in church and you are looking at the world with whatever, wrath, envy, greed, I don't care. This, this man is a warning to what will happen. Colossians 121. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Church, your natural default setting is to be an enemy of God. You are naturally an enemy of the Lord. You have to work to climb the mountain. All you have to do is do nothing to fall. You will naturally descend. Self-control 
brings you to Jesus. Lack of it takes you away. Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and he said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. And Psalms 41.9 says, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted who ate my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Church, 30 pieces of silver wasn't a lot. It wasn't a lot. But when sin has your life, you will be willing to give up much to receive very, very little. And believe me when I tell you that Satan is waiting to trade what you have for what he's got. If you will just give it up. Give up your relationship with Christ. Give up the Holy Spirit. Turn your back on it. What's your price? Satan will give it to you. You want that sin? It's right out that door and it will be found. You don't have to look hard. You go knock, you'll find it. Church, you want to go have a one-night stand? It can be had tonight. You want drugs? You can find them in this city. This city's only like 5,000 people. You can, you can find, I guarantee, every drug you want. Jonathan was talking about finding drugs in the prison. Where there's a will, there's a way. Where someone wants to sin, they will sin. But Judas was willing to give it up for 30 pieces of silver. Saw for three years, three years, the greatness that God did, willing to give it up for nothing, nothing. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Do the things that you wish. Natural state of mind, we're sinners. If you let your mind go idle, you will think of sin. You will not think of pleasant puppies in the next charity. Let your mind go blank for a little bit it will start to sin. Yes. It's the natural reaction. But church, <clears throat> when Judas saw that he was betrayed, when the Lord was betrayed, seeing that Christ was condemned, he was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders saying, I have sinned, betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. And he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. There is no life apart from Christ. There is none. At church, it doesn't matter it truly doesn't matter what Satan has out there. If it has your eye and you're willing to trade this for that, Satan can give you everything outside of these four walls. Everything. Make you Lord of it all. The king of kings that is on the earth until Christ comes. He could make you the greatest one ever. When you get it and you realize what you gave up to get that, you're not going to want it anymore. And it's going to be the death of you. It will lead to your destruction. 
for you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. And a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Church, name one of those that is going to come to you without discipline. We don't know what love is. We don't love naturally like God loves. No. No, that's why it's so amazing to experience it. Because we've never felt that kind of love before. But church, God concludes, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Judas walked with the disciples. And the disciples, when God was sitting there and saying, one of you will betray me, they didn't know who it was. He had put on such a good front, such a mask, that none of his brothers knew it was him. Jesus knew. Church, don't come here trying to put on a front. Because honestly, it doesn't matter. Listen, it doesn't matter. If you're having a rough day, come here having a rough day. Don't try and look spiritual. None of us sitting here are your judge. God knows your true heart. He knows you. But if all you do is put all your effort in trying to convince others that you're good, you're not going to bear anything. And it is a way in for Satan. We are the body of Christ. To me, when he says this, this is nothing but cancer. What is cancer? It's a normal cell that mutates and does what it's not supposed to do. That's all it is. We cannot afford to be thrown into the fire, church. We have to. We have to exude some self-control over ourselves. Satan knows. He knows that he is going to be cast into the lake of fire. And all he wants to do is take as many people with them as possible. That's it. And he will tell you whatever lie you need to do. He will tell you you have a right to hate that person. He will tell you you have a right to judge that person. He will tell you that you should have got that promotion. You're entitled to that. You deserve those nice things. Church, don't listen. Don't listen. Exude some self-control over yourself. Because if you let it in, it is going to start destroying everything. Everything. The home is going to be in chaos. The relationships are going to start breaking apart. Your loved ones are going to be in pain. They are going to be tormented because of the sin that is going on. This is not a judgment. This is just fact. It is almost like physics. If sin is present, it will destroy. For every action, there is an equal opposite reaction. Today, church, all I want to know is are we going to be that church that has the self-control to display Christ?